Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is July 21st. On July 21st, 2011, NASA's Space Shuttle Program completed its final and 135th mission, and when the shuttle Atlantis landed at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, during the program's 30-year history, its five orbiters, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavor, carried more than 350 people into space and flew more than 500 million miles, and shuttle crews conducted important research, serviced the Hubble Space Telescope, and helped in the construction of the International Space Station, among other activities. NASA retired the shuttles to focus on deep space exploration program that could one day send astronauts to asteroids and Mars. In January 1972, two and a half years after America had put the first man on the moon in July 1969, President Richard Nixon publicly announced that NASA would help develop a sp space transportation system design featuring a space vehicle capable of shuttling repeatedly from Earth to orbit and back. Nine years later, on April 12, 1981, at Kennedy Space Center, the first shuttle, Columbia, lifted off in its inaugural mission. Over the course of the next 54 hours, the two astronauts aboard NASA's first reusable spacecraft successfully tested all of its systems and orbited the Earth 37 times before landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. In 1983, a second shuttle, Challenger, was put into service. It flew nine missions before breaking apart shortly after the launch of its 10th mission on January 28, 1986. All seven crew members were killed, including high school teacher Krista McAuliffe, who had won a national contest to be the first U.S. civilian to fly aboard a space shuttle. In the aftermath of the disaster, the space shuttle program was grounded until 1988. The program's third shuttle, Discovery, made its first flight in 1984. Atlantis entered the fleet in 1985 and was followed by Endeavour in 1992. The shuttle program experienced its second major disaster on February 1, 2003, when just minutes before Columbia was scheduled to land at Kennedy Space Center and conclude its 28th mission, it broke apart while re-entering their atmosphere over Texas. All seven astronauts on board perished. Afterward, the shuttle fleet was grounded until July 2005, when Discovery was launched on the program's 114th mission. By the time Discovery completed its 39th and final mission, the most of any shuttle in March of 2011, it had flown 148 million miles, made 5,830 orbits of Earth, and spent 365 days in space. Endeavour completed its 25th and final mission on June of 2011. That mission was commanded by Captain Mark Kelly, husband of former U.S. Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. On July 8th of 2011, Atlantis was launched on its 33rd mission. With four crew members aboard, Atlantis flew thousands of pounds of supplies and extra parts to the International Space Station. It was the 37th mission or flight to make the trip. Thirteen days later, on July 21st, Atlantis touched down at Kennedy Space Center at 5.57 a.m. after a journey of more than 5 million miles, during which it orbited Earth 200 times. Upon landing, the flight's commander, Captain Christopher J. Ferguson, said, Mission complete, Houston. After serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle has earned its place in history and it's come to a final stop. During its 26 years in service, Atlantis flew almost 126 million miles, circled the Earth 4,848 times, and spent 307 days in space. The estimated price tag for the entire space shuttle program from the development to retirement was $209 billion. During the early years of the Great Depression, many school boards responded by cutting salaries and terminating the employment of teachers. Believing that no household should have two wage earners if jobs were scarce, many schools began their budget reductions by firing married women. Many districts enacted across-the-board pay cuts. For example, teachers in Los Angeles saw their pay reduced by 10%. The cuts were even larger in Chicago, where the average teacher saw their pay reduced by almost 25%. Making matters worse, the teachers were not paid not with cash, was special notes printed by the city that were redeemable when businesses paid their share of taxes. In an era when U.S. currency was backed by gold, these tax anticipation warrants were less valued and banks would not redeem them for their full face value. All that 
seemed even less important to many teachers throughout Chicago when the school board simply failed to issue paychecks at all throughout many of the months between 1931 and 1933. By 1933, the average teacher in Chicago was owed six months of back pay. Frustrated by the failure of the union leaders to secure relief, many Chicago teachers built their own organizations and elected leaders who were willing to take to the streets in protest. The Volunteer Emergency Committee, the VEC, led by 32-year-old gym teacher John Fuchs, became one of the significant of those ad hoc organizations. Fuchs and other members of the VEC recognized that businesses throughout the city were still earning profits but responding to the chaos of the Great Depression by hoarding money and refusing to pay taxes. While the police and other public employees continued to be paid each week, Fuchs said, why was the Board of Education unable to pay teachers? He and other teachers led protest marches throughout the city in the spring of 1933. And as awareness of the situation spread, these marches grew to include parents and school children. For the VEC and others, the problem required city leaders to be more aggressive in collecting taxes. In the meantime, they believe the problem of back pay might be solved if banks would agree to purchase tax anticipation warrants from the city. Reflecting their love of education, many teachers were reluctant to join a strike that would hurt their students. Even the simple act of joining a protest march on a day when school was not in session was a radical notion for many teachers who subscribed to the contemporary notion that teachers should maintain a sense of decorum. As the situation worsened and more of their fellow teachers joined the protest, however, teachers like Mary Winfield Carey decide that it was time to cast aside the cloak of super sensitiveness and mock modesty and march forward in the army of the mistreated. When the teachers' week of spring vacation began April 24th, 5,000 teachers gathered here in Grant Park for a rally in March. Organizing themselves into five separate groups, the teachers marched on downtown banks that had refused to buy tax warrants. Not content to merely protest outside of the banks as they had done in the past, hundreds of teachers physically occupied the downtown banks until the police physically removed them from the premises. Two days later, several thousand teachers occupied and several severely damaged the interior lobby of the Chicago Title and Trust. This violence against property quickly escalated to violence against people as police club protesters, many of whom fought back by throwing lobby items at the police. The situation looked dire on Saturday, May 13th. Then, 15,000 teachers assembled here at Grant Park, recognizing that many protesters were ready to commit vandalism in hopes of forcing city leaders to address their concerns. Fuchs addressed the crowd, referring to an agreement to pay the teachers a plan that had not yet been funded. Fuchs assured the crowd that they would soon receive full payment in cash. Although many of Chicago's leaders would not receive full payment for another year, Fuchs and other teachers were able to prevent most of the protesters from committing acts of violence against banks and other institutions throughout the 1933 and 1934. When the leading teachers unions of the city merged in 1937 to become the Chicago Teachers Union, the former gym teacher became the organization's president. Fuchs would later become the leader of the American Federation of Teachers. And then cheers rang out in the streets of Washington on July 16th of 1861 as General Irving McDowell Army, 35,000 strong, marched out to begin the long-awaited campaign to capture Richmond and end the war. It was an army of green recruits, few of whom who had the faintest idea of what magnitude of the task facing them, but their swaggering gait showed that none doubted the outcome. As excitement spread, many citizens and congressmen with wine and picnic baskets followed the army into the field to watch what all expected to be a colorful show. These troops were 90-day volunteers summoned by President Abraham Lincoln after the startling news of Fort Sumner burst over the nation in April of 1861. Called from shops and farms, they had little knowledge of what war would mean. The first day's march covered only five miles, as many straggled to pick up blackberries or fill canteens. McDowell's lumbering columns were headed for the vital railroad junction of Manassas. Here, the Orange and Alexandria Railroad met the Manassas Gap Railroad, which led to the west to the Shenandoah Valley, if McDowell could seize this junction, he would stand beside the best overland approach to the Confederate capital. On July 18th, McDowell's army reached the Centerville. Five miles ahead, a small meandering stream named Bull Run crossed the route of the Union advance, and there, guarding the fords from the Union mills to the Stone Bridge, waited 22,000 southern troops under the command of General Pierre G.T. Beauregard. McDowell's first attempt to move forward Confederate right flank, but his troops were checked at Blackburn's Ford. Then he spent the next two days scouting the southern left flank. In the meantime, Beauregard asked the Confederate government at Richmond for help. General Joseph E. Johnson 
stationed in the Shenandoah Valley with 10,000 Confederate troops, was ordered to support Beauregard if possible. Johnston gave an opposing Union army the slip, and employing the Manassas Gap Railroad, started his brigades toward Manassas Junction. Most of Johnston's troops arrived at the junction between July 20th and 21st, some marching directly into battle. On the morning of July 21st, McDowell sent his attack columns in a large march toward north towards Sudley Springs Ford. This route took the Federals around the Confederate left. To distract the Southerners, McDowell ordered a diversionary attack where the Warrenton Turnpike crossed Bull Run at Stone Bridge. At 5.30 a.m., the deep-throated roar of a 30-pounder Parrot rifle shattered the morning calm and signaled the start of the battle. McDowell's new plan depended on speed and surprise, both difficult with inexperienced troops. Valuable time was lost as the men stumbled through the darkness along narrow roads. Confederate Nate, Colonel Nathan Evans, commanding the Stone Bridge, soon realized that the attack on his front was only a diversion. Leaving a small force to hold the bridge, Evans rushed the remainder of his command to Matthews Hill in time to check McDowell's lead unit, but Evans' force was too small to hold back the Federals for long. Soon brigades under Bernard B. and Francis Bartow marched to Evans' assistance, but even with these reinforcements, a thin gray line collapsed and Southerners fled in disorder toward Henry Hill, attempting to rally his men. B General used General Thomas Jackson's newly arrived brigade as an anchor. Pointing to Jackson, B shouted, There stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. General Johnston and Beauregard then arrived at Henry Hill, where they assisted in rallying shattered bridges, brigades and redeploying fresh units that were marching to the point of danger. About noon, the Federals stopped their advance to reorganize for a new attack. The lull lasted for about an hour, giving the Confederates enough time to reform their lines. Then the fighting resumed, each side trying to force the other off of Henry Hill. The battle continued until just after 4 p.m. when fresh southern units crashed into the Union right flank on Chin Ridge, causing McDowell's tired and discouraged soldiers to withdraw. At the first withdrawal was orderly, screened by the regulars, with three-month volunteers retired across Bull Run, where they found the road to Washington jammed with the carriages of congressmen and others who had driven out to Centerville to watch the fight. Panic now seized many of the soldiers, and the retreat became a rout. The Confederates, though bolstered by the arrival of President Jefferson Davis on the field just as the battle was ending, were too disorganized to follow up on their success. Daybreak on July 22nd found the defeated Union Army back behind the bristling defenses of Washington. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. ThePeopleHistory.com The Final NASA Space Shuttle Mission at History.com No Money for Teachers Pay at TheCleo.com First Battle of Bull Run at NPS.gov the music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing, as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.